limitations or the problem, the hemodialysis. In fact, the short-term problem is what has already been covered by you already, and that is the vascular access, and that is how to take the blood out of the patient. And uh, mind you, you, when you take the blood out for hemodialysis, you need to take about um, something like 200 to 30 ml of blood per minute, which is very high flow. And uh, AV, AV fister is a standard, as you have already said already. But sometimes uh, it takes time to mature, as uh, we say that uh, 6 to 8 weeks, or even up to 8 weeks to mature. So that uh, during that invading, invading time, that uh, we may have to some, we need to have some, something to do. And uh, Liu have already told us that he can cannulate the vein, the vein veins, for putting the venous catheters to cannulate great veins. It can, the advantage is that it can be immediately used after the placement. And there's no need for needle puncturing, and the patient is essentially painless. But which vein and what catheters? Liu has already talked about, but I just very briefly said, we can do the femoral vein, but this is not suitable for the ambulatory patient when the patient walks around. And the subclavian vein is something that uh, we, what we begin with that uh, we may not originally start the dialysis. But there's a danger of a subclavian vein stenosis, which is the great part. And to allow this, the internal jugular vein, as the deal have already said, that uh, this is now the vein of choice. And uh, again, you can see that this, this patient has, internal, has been uh, punctured with a subclavian vein puncture, and you can notice that the vein is quite engorged compared with the other side. And uh, if you don't believe me, you can look at here. You can see that this patient got a subclavian vein puncture already, and you can see that the subclavian vein is stenotic, and you can see the dilated vein over here on just one side and not the other side. So that uh, subclavian vein stenosis is the main concern about us, and now we are that uh, we use internal jugular vein. So that's simple. And what catheter? And uh, Liu have already told us about this single lumen catheter, the double lumen catheter, and tunnel catheters that uh, I probably won't go into details. But uh, in fact, when we first start Liu, we use a tank cough catheter. You may, not, you may not believe me, but the tank cough catheter is often used for peritoneal dialysis. But uh, we can, in fact, you use just use this tank cough catheter, we cut off these side holes, and then just use it to inter put it into the internal jugular vein. And this is it. You can see that. This is the internal jugular vein, this is the tunnel part, and then you go right in. Oh, sorry, this is the catheter, this is the tunnel, and we go right into the internal jugular vein. And in fact, the flow is very good. I can easily put it to 600 ml per minute. It's very, very good. And it is very cheap. And at that time, there's no other catheters available, just the tank of catheter that I use. And uh, later on, we have the double lumen catheter, and then you can see these two lumens, as we say. And uh, the tip of the catheter is usually in the right atrium is here, so that you can see the catheter is the right atrium here. And, uh, uh, and as you as, uh, just, as, as Leo said already, that uh, if you have this catheter chuckling out into the into the head, this is not very particularly comfortable, so that uh, we use it uh, for curved ones, so that the patient will feel much better. And uh, the other thing is that uh, sometimes, in, in fact, the mature case, we do it ourselves and we don't ask Leo to do it, we reserve Leo for the fistula, because that uh, many times we can just Use an under X-ray control, this ultrasound control, we can do the cannulation and do the fistula, uh, do the cannulation ourselves. And this is what we call the subcutaneous tunnel, as you can see. That is, you enter internal jugular vein, you go through the subcutaneous tunnel before the catheters come out. The, the, and this is the cuff that uh, Leo has already referred to in because that's uh, the tissue overgrowth that uh, you can secure the catheter. And the advantage of a catheter like tunnel is two way. One is that uh, it is you have much better to enter the catheter. And secondly, if there's an infection, as you know, the infection must come which at the body level, and then it has to travel all the way before it goes into the into the vein. And by that time you have severe inflammation, so that uh, it sounds a bell already. So this is very easy. So temporary complication, there's the bleeding or infection and so on that below, and you can see that there's a clotting there. So the venous catheter is like this. Both the tunnel catheter with inner material can last for months. You can see that the perm can I put in quotation as as Neil and I always said there's nothing permanent except God, so that we choose a permanent catheter there. And it can replace percutaneous under X-ray. No need to ask Neil to do that. We we, we the, the physicians can do it. But AV is still the drug of choice. So that is about the short-term complication. The main thing is that the short-term is about the vascular access. But what about the long-term? The long-term, we can worry about the cardiovascular event, the nerve degeneration, the muscle degeneration, and amyloidosis that uh, we probably mentioned about the last time. 
And uh, you remember last time I said that there's a three basic concepts in dialysis. The first concept is dialysis take part in the dialyzer, which we mentioned in last time. And the secondly, the process of toxin removal during dialysis is not physiological, it's by dialysis. Because in our kidneys, they go by filtration. That we already covered last time already. And uh, so that we now say, if you look at how, how long can a patient survive, the fistula that can last a very long time under, under Leo's hands. But what about the patient? I want you to look at this. This is the patient. If you have a patient, if you, if this is a general population, about the incidence of cardiovascular mortality in the general population. And you can see if the 20, 25 years of age, you have very little chance of having a cardiovascular event, or, or very high chance that you will die from a heart attack. But even in a dialysis population, you see, they always they have a very high chance of being of, of dying from a of, of a middle disease of a cardiovascular event. And even if you get older, of course, the general population you got uh, more in, increased incidence of a heart attack. But still, it is still much higher than much, much lower than the general dialysis population. So, so the lesson that, that we, the lesson that we want to learn is how can we reduce the cardiovascular death risk and improve the patient outcome. And uh, I don't recommend you to, to listen to the patient's body like that. Okay, this is not a particular way to examine the patient. And uh, but this is so so that comes to our third concept in dialysis. Two, the first two one we I gave you the last time, and that is the renal patient has an increased risk of cardiovascular event, and uh, the risk actually maintained there, despite you connect the hypertension, diabetes, and hypercholesterolemia, which we know, they, these are the usual, usual risk factor for cardiovascular event. But if the patient is on dialysis or got kidney disease, even if you correct all these, they still have an increased incidence of cardiovascular events. And why is it? Because that because the patient have a secondary hyperparathyroidism. And uh, I briefly go through why we have the secondary hyperparathyroidism. And that is the renal patient usually have a phosphate retention because the kidney pays, the kidneys cannot excrete the phosphate. So in the blood, the phosphate accumulates in the blood. And the phosphate will be due, would somehow would cause the blood calcium to go down. But the body cannot tolerate any hypocalcemia. So the parathyroid gland was stimulated to maintain this normal calcium. So at the end of the day, the patient's serum calcium is normal in the renal failure patient, but at the extent of hyperparathyroidism. That is, originally you're high phosphate, so you got the low phosph calcium. And then the calcium has to go up because or else then you got a lot of complications, right? And then once you have this hypercalcemia, that is because of the hyperparathyroidism. The parathyroid gland would compensate so that you have a hyperparathyroidism. So we say that. Uh, uh, sorry, because I don't know why it doesn't appear here. That's uh, don't don't worry. Oh, oh, I see. So that you can see the parathyroid gland is getting bigger and bigger as as, as the time of the dialysis go on. And by the time that you said have a nodule, that uh, you got this is tertiary hyperparathyroidism. Then things are getting more complicated. Well, this is given me by 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 my friend in airport, and uh, somehow that uh, they, they is so clumsy to me. But the thing is. The consequence of secondary hyperparathyroidism, previously we say this is renal dystrophy, this is bone pain, fractures, hypercalcemia, and so on. But nowadays we concentrate more here, and that is that uh, hyperparathyroidism will cause blood left ventricular hypertrophy in the sisal fibrosis of the myocardium, and that the uh, valvular cal calcification. These are all predisposed the patient to a heart attack. And of course, we don't pay more the patient to have heart attack because we spend so much of the time, so much of the energy to keep the patient alive. And we don't really want the patient to die from a heart attack. So that, that is the... That is because the idea is because that uh, when you have the chronic kidney disease, then uh, that, uh, you can see that this is the, this is the medial calcification. That is, you have the calcification in, in, in the media of the arteries, and that's predisposed the patient to have a heart attack. And the treatment of secondary hyperparathyroidism, the first and most important thing is that uh, you control the phosphate. Because the thing is like this, because that, uh, that the kidney is failing, that you cannot excrete the phosphate, and the phosphate accumulates. And uh, you may say that uh, because in the patient on dialysis, we always ask the patient to take more protein, because protein is good for body building. And you have to appoint the patient on dialysis already so that uh, you can remove the urea through the dialysis. So you ask the patient to take more protein. 
but unfortunately, nearly all, all, all proteins will contain phosphate, or all food will contain phosphate. So you will need uh, some phosphate binders to bind it. So this is the first thing. The first and most important thing is to control the high mass phosphatemia. Our target is 1.6 millimole per liter. So you look at the result, it's more than 1.6 millimole per liter of phosphate. We know that some babies are failed. And, uh, and secondly, we want to direct suppress the release of TPT or have a surgical removal of the polyphyroid. And uh, these are the sorts of the phosphate binders we have. And uh, the first thing is the calcium carbonate that uh, in the private user could use a oscal. In Dr. Zhang's case, you use the calcium. Right? This is just calcium carbonate. The recent result is because the calcium carbonate will combine with the phosphate in the food in the intestine. So that have an in, 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 a, in a sort of a complex which will excrete in the feces without being, excrete, without being absorbed in the blood. So calcium carbonate is in fact a very good sort of uh, phosphate binder. Previously, we have the what we call aluminium hydroxide, which we call allotem. But uh, in fact, it's a very good phosphate binder. The, but the trouble is that this aluminium, some of the aluminium will go into the blood and cause a lot of complications. So calcium carbonate or calcium acetate would be the drug of choice. The, the, the trouble is because with this calcium carbonate, it's very difficult to take. And secondly, that uh, it would cause constipation with too much of the calcium. So calcium carbonate is the first choice. And recently, we have the, what we call the venous gel, Sivalavir. It is in fact a resin, just like your isonium, that it would absorb, it would ab absorb the, the phosphate in the, in the food so that it can excrete out in the feces. So that venous gel would be one thing, and this is, this is, another, this is just an, an, another sort of resin, but uh, you have a different base. This is a, this is a chloride and this is a carbonate, it doesn't really matter. So, and recently we have the one called the phosphino. Phosphino is in fact a lanthanum. This is lanthanum carbonate. So instead of using give the patient calcium carbonate, you give the patient lanthanum carbonate. Lanthanum carbonate, again, that's how uh, it will bind to the phosphate and then excrete out in the feces. In fact, lanthanum is pretty good. Don't you have to use it? It's pretty good. Not, not very good enough. Also. Yeah, it's, it's very good, but as you say, it's very expensive. You just take it three, 500 milligrams three times a day, and uh, the phosphate goes down very quickly. I'm sure you use renal gel, but the trouble with renal gel is you take a lot of tablets, especially you have the 400 milligram tablets. It doesn't really work. You have to give them 800 milligram tablets so that you have lots of tablets to take. But lanthanum carbonate is something good. It's quite good, but have no shares in it. In it. Then, so that's uh, the medication. The other, the other medication is that you use a vitamin D analog because, as you know, vitamin D can suppress the release of the parathyroid. But the trouble with the vitamin D analog is that it will cause the hypercalcemia, as you know. Any vitamin D will cause hypercalcemia. And recently, we have the third, so-called the third generation vitamin D, so the parcalcitone. It is very effective in reducing the parathyroid level and without too much risk of the hypercalcemia. So, and, uh, so that this is the, this is the thing that uh, we are very interested in because we just give this, this parcalcitone and you can suppress the parathyroid hormone without too much danger of having a hypercalcemia. And calcium magnetics is also a very interesting method that uh, I would like to be, refer to you later. And uh, so these are the products with the second hyperparathyroidism. Why I spend so much time with this is because if you don't treat the second hyperparathyroidism, you end up with the patient with heart attack. So that previously we have the long selective vitamin D analog. In fact, we've been using this for a long, long time already. This is a vitamin D derivative, say the calcium cho, calcium trial, whatever. And then we have a more selective sort of the vitamin D, which is called a parcalcitol or simpla, that uh, we can have a more effective suppression of the parathyroid hormone, in effectively so that can be reduce one of the risks of cardiovascular death in our patients. And you can see here that uh, even we give this parcalcitol, we can suppress the parathyroid hormone, there isn't much in way of the hypercalcemia, which is very good to us. Previously, what we have to do is that we have to reduce the